Um, tell us a little bit of, about you, how long you've been an artist, what inspires you, and uh, then the next thing we'll get into why abstraction, but um, tell us a little bit about you. Good afternoon, thank you for being here, and uh, I'm going to coin a phrase we were using this morning from a movie that Susan just happens to be, welcome to the greatest show on earth. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Leo Pasolik, as Susan has mentioned, I've been an artist for 44 years. It, it has been, uh, it has been uh, a great, great journey, an adventure from day to day with great surprises and wonderful, wonderful times along the way. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I have, I have been represented nationally and internationally. Um, I've had the pleasure of being um, in many, 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 many collections, uh, museum and, collect and private corporate collections, as many artists here have. And that's always a privilege and a pleasure, believe me. Um, to say what, who I am and what I am, I have, as I said, I've studied in New York City uh, back in the early 60s. Uh, it gives my age away a little bit. And that's where I hailed from at School of Visual Arts in New York. And it was a great place because it was a place where you didn't really learn or they weren't about teaching. It was about grasping who you were and what you were capable of as an artist and developing what you were capable of and building on that. That was an immense, an immense gift to every artist who went to that school who grasped that possibility. Because that really is the essence of what keeps you going every year of your life in this business. Because it's not easy, but it's a great adventure. So, um, given that, uh, everything else is uh, abstraction, is an interesting topic, and I guess I can go from there, if I may. Well, let's do, yeah. Yeah. Let's do the introduction, okay. Good afternoon, I'm Bruce Marion, and I've been an artist most of my life. I, I was blessed with amazing parents who had me in, I was in painting, adult painting classes when I was nine years old, and it was just something that I kind of always knew I wanted to do. And I originally went into commercial art, I was an illustrator for about 20 years, and did artwork for, like when you used to go into, I don't even know if Toys R Us is around anymore, but if you ever went in there and saw games, I did artwork that were was on board games and three-dimensional puzzles and I did magazine covers and all that sort of work which was a great training but in my heart I always really wanted to be a fine artist so when I was approaching moving into my later 30s um, I started getting that feeling like probably many people do like time's not going to go on forever you better get your rear ending gear and get on with what you're here to do in life and, and that's when I transitioned into fine art so it's been an absolute amazing journey. I, I love it. I love the I love the part where it's constant learning. Um, I I love studying different styles and trying to understand why things work and and, and experimenting. And, and I I feel like I'm sort of an artistic scientist, mad scientist, getting to try different things and and explore really. And I think that's what's so exciting about it. And many times I have people come in my booth and go. Whoa, your work has changed so much from last year. I've heard that about a thousand times. <laughs> I'm like, yes, it has. But I've, I've accepted that a long time ago. It's sort of my nature. I have, you know, I, I love that part. So is there anything else I was supposed to say? Great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Jessica Wachter, and I come from Bismarck, North Dakota. So I'm pretty excited to be down here for three months and leave the very cold um, North Dakota. But I've been a professional artist um, for nearly a decade now. And um, I, again, just gravitated towards arts. Um, had incredible parents that exposed me to art classes at a really young age. Um, we traveled, and I always went to art museums and galleries and also encouraged me to make sure to follow what you're truly passionate about and what you love and you'll be successful. So I um, continued that and went on to North Dakota State University and majored in art and interior design and have been lucky enough to make this my full-time career. Yay. <laughs> Hello everybody. Um, I think I'm going to start by talking about my parents. The first time 
Eye Blue Glass was with a $30 blowtorch from Home Depot, and I set it up in the laundry room in the house I grew up in, in Susan's old neighborhood, or my old neighborhood, and um, nobody thought it was going to turn into anything. I was basically taking sticks of glass and melting them, twisting them, bending them, putting them together, and I don't think anybody would have guessed that some Almost 11 years later, I'd be up here talking about abstract art. I am primarily almost completely self-taught. I did not go to art school. Um, I've been a professional artist for about 10 years. At first, I had low expenses because I lived with my parents, which enabled me to keep the dream going. I didn't have to get a day job because I had low expenses. And um, I think if I had to flip burgers, I wouldn't be doing what I was doing today. So they let me keep following the dream, and here we are. So, anything else? Yeah, it's very nice. It's very good. Let's hear it for the parents. <laughs> it's really amazing, and and something to, to be grateful for is to be given that opportunity to pursue your your dreams, and you know, not be told. Like when I was in high school, the counselors were like, oh, you need to be a teacher or a secretary. I guess that's aging myself too, but um, so I, I, later on I busted that mold too, but um, I did go to secretarial school. That's not good. So, um, all right, so, so the topic today is definitely about abs abstract art. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people think of abstract as just a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense, but there's lots of sense to it. And one other thing I didn't ask you is maybe throughout the day, uh, throughout the topic here, maybe talk about whose work has inspired you, because I think that always kind of speaks to what, um, where you came from and what maybe lingers in the back of your mind. So we'll go down the row again and just, you know, tell us why Abstract captured your heart. Interestingly enough, it, and ironically, it started from my first day in art school. It literally did. Uh, we all entered our class and we were extraordinarily excited, of course, and here we were, we laid out all our paints and it was 1963, aging myself again, but um, Mr. Haas's class, I remember him well, and here we were, we put all our colors out and he looked at us and he goes, okay, you learned how to stretch a canvas, great, now everything you have on your palette, put away, take out white and blue, and all of a sudden we looked at each other and said, Okay, what's this all about? Well, what this was all about was learning the basics about how to handle space design. Design, design, design. What do you do with a space, a canvas? What do you do from corner to corner, from edge to edge? And that was the essence of what you learned. And that was about form, shape, and what you can do with the gradations of just two colors and what you can get out of it. This obviously has a lot more color, but believe me, before I got there, I had to understand how to utilize those colors before they could actually work. And that is the whole essence. But the reality is, no matter, we, I, was, I took anatomy, I took life drawing, I took all the basic elements that you would, would take in art school, I learned from Baron Hogarth, who is world-renowned, and here we were, learning all these wonderful things, but all of a sudden I realized, you have to be aware of not just the positive space on the surface, you have to be aware of the negative space because that was a part of the art. And most images that you look at, you don't think about that, but when you look at something, you're not aware that it's happening. That is created by a negative space, which becomes a part of the painting, whether it's done with another color or with a white area. However, this went on for some time, and over the years, because of my uh, my design abilities and my uh, interest in what I was doing as an illustrator. In fact, I was an illustrator major. Painting was my secondary. I ended up doing board games also, and I ended up doing album covers and all kinds of other things along the way, but in every, in every essence, I realized no matter what I did, I had to be aware of the elementary factor of being aware of what it took. And that takes you to how do you create an abstract painting? Well, you create an abstract painting by having the respect and the, keeping the integrity of what you're doing by taking an object and destructing it, taking it apart, 
in order to take it apart, you have to know what it was to begin with. So that when you're looking at a shape, you know where you're taking that, up, that, that space, that line. And what is that going to relate to? How is that color next to that other color going to relate? Are you creating a, a, you know, a horizon? Why are you creating a horizon? Because you want the participant, the observer, who I always refer to as the participant. I never consider you the observer. I consider you a participant in the painting. I want you to walk into that painting. I want you to be in that painting. I want you to be able to walk around it and become every part of it. No matter how abstract it is, you're going to find a place where you're going to find yourself looking at it for other reasons. You're going to see objects that you never realized were, yes, they're abstract, but, oh, it's a horizon. It's a sunset. It's a, it's a vertical line that creates a wall or some other element that we're all familiar with. These are the fineries. These are the little simple nuances that happen in abstract painting that oftentimes people go, you know, I don't understand it, but I like it. <laughs> you, you suddenly realize, yes, I know. <laughs> you know. But these are the things that you have. I've had the pleasure of being available to me. And if this, just, if this didn't happen like in the last one, two, or three, or five years. This was a process because a good deal of my work has to do with, with a narrative. It has to do with... Uh, landscape. Who influenced me? Ironically, here's the, here's the here's the big catch. Cezanne. Why Cezanne? Paul Cezanne was one of the first people to create a method or a, an idea of uh, post uh, impressionism or expressionism. He was the cube. He was a cubist. He was the founder and father of cubism. If you look at his paintings, you'll see the angles in his leaves and his backgrounds. Those are, those are angular, rectangular shapes that are interceding, intercepting. Uh, he did a portrait of his mother, and he left the hand undone. And the artist would say, why did you leave the hand undone? And he said, the hand is done. <laughs> These are things, that, and this is a person who I, uh, you know, completely admired my whole life for that reason. So, that, hopefully, that takes care of How am I supposed to follow that? Yeah. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a confession. So when I was younger, I thought people that painted abstract were just people that didn't know how to draw or paint well. How many have ever thought that? Yeah, raise your hand if you ever thought that. Like, learn how to draw. Jeez, take a class. So. I mentioned I was an illustrator, so when I started moving into fine art, I started getting this guttural feeling like I wanted to play with abstraction, and I really didn't know, sorry, I really didn't know why. So my first abstract painting, I grabbed some tubes of paint and just literally started squirting them on a huge canvas, not really having a concept of what I was doing. But for the next six or seven years, I painted purely abstract. And first, my, in fact, my first years in this show, I did all abstraction. And what I learned was incredible because in abstraction, you've got to grab the viewer without having any sort of visual hook. You don't have the tree. You don't have the apple. You don't have the bird, the animal. We only have the tools of art of you know, edge control and value and a lot of things Leo was talking about. So it's an amazing and very difficult process and to this day, I mean, I do wildlife, I do landscapes, I do figurative, but I find abstraction one of the most challenging things to paint because you don't have all of those things. You don't have the object to grab somebody. You only have the shape, the movement, the way the color is moving through a piece. Thank you, Casey. I thought I'd bring one of my small ones. Oh, I did bring a little <laughs> And for me, my abstraction is about movement and flow. And in fact, it's called my flow series, and, um, which to me reflects about life and our journey and, and how, how that takes us. And sometimes we end up going in interesting directions that we didn't necessarily anticipate. So that's, that's what I like to explore. But. Uh, I think that's all. Oh, and Franz Klein, a lot of the um, the painters from the 50s, William de Kooning, a lot of those guys, just the energy they brought into their paintings and how dramatic and powerful they were. Like Franz Klein just using black and white, basically, but big, bold strokes and 
and laying it down. One other thing I want to mention, what I realized was abstraction is a lot like improv jazz. So I think representational painting is more like a, 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 a hymn you can come out singing, like when you see a good show tune or whatnot. Jazz, you can't quite come out singing it. It's more of a feeling and it's more of taking you on a journey. And that's kind of where I've come to with it, where abstraction is like, is like jazz. Thank you. So I would say mine went way back to when I was really young and um, you would go out to eat and get some, um, a, you know, a piece of paper that you would draw on or, and I'd flip it over and I just wanted to like create my own drawing. I never, we never had coloring books. I just wanted to like make whatever I wanted to make and not be follow rules or stay in these lines. And even Legos, like I didn't want to build what they gave. I just made my own Lego land and kind of created it. So I think it was in me since really young. But um, again, like what they're talking about when you go to college or when I went, um, you know, you took the realism classes and the drawing and, and um, still life and until I was able to tap into the abstract um, world, I finally came alive and I it like just exploded and I think something came inside me that I was able to create and I felt a whole different level of um, passion or excitement about it versus just copying what I saw or what was in front of me or you know an image or a person is 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 how did that maybe spark in you know the, the movement and take that from that or the experience and the color and the texture and apply it in such a different way and going back into college, when we had to first, you know, look up artists and, and find new artists, I um, stumbled upon Joan Mitchell, and it was just a book I came upon, and I loved her work. I was, and she was a female painter as well, which there weren't a ton of female painters, and so I was even more kind of provoked by what she was creating. And when I started looking at the sizes of her canvases, they were huge. And so then I started to creating really big canvases. Like my first one was like eight feet by 10 feet in college, which is huge. You know, they were like, what are you doing? You can't even get it through the doors. Um, but I really liked what she was doing. And so that's kind of one of my first um, artists that really inspired me or provoked me to start creating in the abstract expressionist way. Um, and then finally, when I got to see one of her pieces in person, that, um, I mean, it literally brought me to tears. And it was just like, wow, there is something there that I got personally versus um, realist paintings or anything like that. And so that's kind of where that, that journey went. All right. So these three jokers think they have it hard. Yeah. <laughs> abstract painters, it's been around for a while. I'm an abstract glass blower, sculptor. It's an uphill battle. Um, so this piece over here, I made for the show last year, and it actually finally found a home today, which is awesome, but. I'm very glad it did because everybody that looks at it asks me if I know what jacks are. And I say, yes, I know what jacks are, but that's not a jack. Um, you know, the game jacks, a lot of people are familiar with them. This piece is called Brothers 2. Brothers 1 sold last year. Um, but you might ask, why is it called Brothers? Why is it called Brothers 2? Well, I have a brother and I think I'm on the left and he's on the right. Each one of us has different things in life that we lean on sometimes. Sometimes you're kind of falling that way, falling this way. So the whole piece is kind of interactive. You can turn it and flip it and sometimes we're mad at each other and I'll be over here and he'll be over there. That's why it's a set of two pieces because they move independently of each other. And then they're both clear um, because we've both had some struggles in life and you need to be able to see through to the other side and get through your challenges. If you look at that piece, you say it looks like a jack, you know? Um, so it's definitely an uphill battle. It doesn't look like a jack anymore. It doesn't look like a jack anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, that's Ethan and that's Caleb. Uh, he's a little bit older than me. But yeah, honestly, I never thought I would be an abstract sculptor. Um, I made decorative vases and shop glasses and little trinkets and that kind of thing for seven, eight years of my life, which teaches you a lot about how to be a glass blower. It's a very, um, there's a sharp learning curve to playing with hot glass. This kind of glass melts at about 3,500 degrees. So trying to control it and learn how to shape it and do what you want it to do is hard. But I made more shot glasses and vases and all that kind of stuff that I can count. And I said, you know what, it's time for something new. And then I just basically went the complete other direction. Pretty much last year, when I got into the show for the first time, it was a brand new body of work. Um, I had never done anything like it before. I had no idea if people were going to laugh at me, if they were going to say, you're stupid, why'd you do that? That doesn't make any sense. Um, I brought it, people liked it, and it's just grown and grown and grown. What am I forgiving? Well, I like the story of when we met, because he was, every year we, close out the show in September because we've got the program to lay out, you know, promoting to do and so forth. And we had a kind of last minute cancellation and I sent an email out to the artist saying, we've got an opening if anybody recommends somebody. So Seth and Troy, two of our other glass artists who are also phenomenal, um, told Caleb because they all work together at the Mesa Art Center, which is a phenomenal place. If you haven't been there, put it on your list of places to go. Um, and so Caleb's name came up and we got the application and it wasn't what I would say complete as far as the number of images he sent, but there was something about it. And then I called him one day and we talked and he said, well, I'm kind of going through a transition and I don't really have the full body work. I always have trouble with technical. And he said, I, I'm not sure I'm ready. And I said, you're absolutely ready. And this is the incubator that you need to be in to make that leap. Wow. And then, now I'm crying. And then, and, then, and then we met for coffee. And I was like 45 minutes late because I was at a meeting that went on forever. And he was gracious and waited for me. And um, you know, there's just something about what we do in curating the show and, and working with the artists is you know, sometimes you have to see that little spark. And we see it in, in all the artists once they get here, but when we don't know them, can't meet them in person, it's different. But there was something about that, and and I definitely pushed, and he was like, walked in, he's like, oh, like many artists the first year, he's like, what the heck have I said yes to? But, so talk about that leap of faith and yeah. what that meant. Um, so like she said, I had barely even heard of the show before. A good friend of mine was already accepted into the show. He told me I should apply. Um, this was in mid-October, I think. And the show starts in January. I was going through a complete veering off to the side, making complete new work, and um, had just begun that path. I needed to submit images to apply for the show because it's a juried show and I had no images. So I basically, one of the pieces I submitted for the application was actually two different pieces and I put them together into a more interesting configuration in hopes that it would look better than each piece by itself. Um, but I had a passion, I had a desire to do new things. I knew that this was either sink or swim, and it was easily the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. I bought a house, I'm married. Um, those were pretty scary, but this is way worse. Sorry, honey. I guess other than that, I don't have a ton of deeply specific artists that inspire me. Um, my sector of the world is kind of a strange one. I do an offshoot of glass blowing called lamp working, which is all done on a torch as opposed to out of a furnace, like many of you have seen furnace glass blowing. So there aren't very many lamp workers that do abstract sculptures. 
Um, but there is one gentleman who's inspired my work ethic more than anybody I can think of, and that is who Susan mentioned, Seth Fairweather. He's an artist in the back, and he's probably the hardest working guy that I've ever met in my life. He's been a huge inspiration to me, and has taught me what it means to work a long day. Yeah. Excellent. So I just had to, people were looking for Leo, so he's, I made him leave for a minute to go connect with his people. So, um, so we're going to come back to him. So I'll sit here while he's gone. Um, I like what you were talking about, the flow and the connection. And again, how many of you have ever looked at abstract art and thought, what are they doing? They, they should take a drawing class. But then how many of you have had that moment when, when it connected? And kind of maybe you can talk a little bit too what, what Leo was talking about, negative space. And one of the reasons we do these talks is to get people to maybe think like an artist. When you look out and you see negative space, we never, we never think about it. But can you, can you describe a little bit of, like give us an example of how that, what we're seeing in negative. So um, our brains are not conditioned to see negative space because it's really, in a sense, not important us as humans. Negative space would be the space around the saber-toothed tiger coming to kill you. So obviously we're going to focus on the thing, the danger coming at us. So we're not trained, but part of artist training that's so important is to see the space around because that, thank you, keep that close enough, because that affects the entire composition and also there's a lot of techniques involved where you can create really beautiful painting by instead of painting the object, you paint everything but the object and wind up with the object. And I, I use that a lot in my cityscapes, landscapes, and whatnot. And it's kind of very similar, actually, to a sculptor. Because a sculptor is starting with, a, say, a big block, like Michelangelo, big block of stone. He's chipping away all the negative space to reveal the image. So when I'm painting, a lot of times, I'll cover my entire canvas with an abstraction and then with a lighter value or darker value color, lighter or darker than what I have there, I'll start chipping away and actually honing my image by painting everything but the image. So if you're looking at me now, like the negative spaces, everything, the shapes around my head, shapes around Susan's head. And as an artist, you need to be able to jump back and forth from out here to there and be able to paint your subject both ways. It's a very useful technique. But it takes training and conditioning because we don't naturally do that. So it messes with, messes with your brain. It's like, <laughs> um, I'd like to tell you about the importance of composition. Filling the canvas, Jessica. How do you do that? Um, so I guess the, you know, the, the other big thing is color and composition and um, for me, I work really large scale on very big paintings, and the bigger the better challenge, um, but it's, it's being mindful of every part of the canvas. And in this one, I've covered a lot of the canvas, and in some I, I don't cover as much, or you'll have the um, empty space or negative space you're talking about, but the composition, you know, it, it takes you time and energy to get to to the where you want to go with an abstract painting and a lot of times you're studying the piece and stepping back from it than actually physically working on the piece which people don't realize is just as important as is physically mark making or you know showing that through texture or the scale of the brush um, and so it's interesting when people come to watch you paint because they're like, well, you're not doing anything. You're just, you know, sitting here. And I'm like, but this is so important, um, this time spent, or you just put one mark there. And, and I think, but that mark can speak volumes or can really dictate or um, just by the little amount of red that I have in there that you maybe don't notice and it takes you, you know, the conversation that you're having with this piece or I hope that you have with this piece is, is coming back to it multiple times too and, and noticing colors or shapes within that you didn't see the first time. And that's what's really exciting even when clients come back and they're like, it matters what time and day I see it, what mood I'm in. I see so many different colors or that I didn't see when I first saw that. And, and that's exciting for me as an artist or creator is that I'm...